2002 Supervision presents Digital Nitrate, a video podcast. Well, Joel, we finally made it to Hollywood. <laughs> what do you, oh, oh, Jesus Christ. Oh, the Are sooner, you okay? The sooner we leave here, the better. It is draining my soul away. But you it were is. so gung-ho about getting here to Venice Beach, and now you want to go back? I, I've, I, It's worse than I thought. It's just worse than I ever thought it could be. It's called yeah, I mean, Beach. And it's mm, like this? Yeah, I mean, you can visibly see the pollution, and there's just blood on the beach. That's not good. Um, We've just got to get through tonight, sleep yep. it off. Tomorrow, mm. we'll be out of here by the evening. I swear to God, we're getting out of here as soon as possible. That's the hope, but... You know, I did bring some films to maybe, maybe, maybe you'll learn to love this place. I did find some films down in the salt mine that might, you know, explain a few things, help us get used to L.A. and its culture. So maybe if we like uh, head back to the maybe. motel, maybe uh, put those on, get you, get yeah. you. Yeah, some you like that idea, buddy? You know, some of it will make me fall in love with the town and its culture. Something beautiful, something that really speaks to the spirit of yeah. Los Angeles. Yeah. Alright, let's uh. Oh. From director Robert Altman comes a story yeah. of Hollywood. It's Robert Altman time. Everybody sit down and start talking over each other. The player is a look at the Hollywood studio roller coaster through the eyes of a first draft Columbo villain. A world so grimy and putrid you'll feel just like a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Tim Shack Daddy Robin stars as Griffin Mill, a studio executive harassed by a mystery screenwriter he previously rejected. He stars alongside just a fucking bunch of people, a lot of people, a veritable who's who of Hollywood, if you will. There's tension, there's thrills, and Tim Robbins is six foot five, so do not bother looking it up, stay on this tab. Can we talk about something other than Hollywood for a change? Yes. We're educated yeah. people. Sure. <laughs> so we've talked about the uh the Tim Robbins height thing already. I'm glad we got it out in the open. We need to talk about this and address this. Oh, we the do. American public needs to know. I literally I have a note about Vincent D'Onofrio. We're jumping ahead already. Like fuck it. <laughs> Like, Fuck it. Whatever. Uh, I have a note about Vincent D'Onofrio. He's known for being very tall and stocky in this film because they only put him next to Tim Robbins. He is not tall or stocky. No, he kind of like, looks like a little baby. Fucking throws me off. Because mm -hmm. Tim Robbins is apparently just a giant amongst men. Yeah, it's, it's not just one thing that he's a really good looking guy. He also had to be like attractively tall yeah aggressively tall <laughs> yeah <laughs> some people have it all so what, so what do you think of the player huh you enjoy it this was a, a nice little surprise because i don't think i've seen any altman before this one which no. i know is going to get me you know burned at the stake yeah but definitely he certainly uh, impressed with this piece here. I've only seen Popeye, so... That's a good one. It's a really I've been told. good one. I like Popeye. <laughs> but the player is not in the same world as Popeye at all. There is no whimsy in this script. This film does sort of lack that je ne sais quoi, that childlike beauty that Popeye has. <laughs> as a as a as an entity, this is in a way some some critics might describe it as the anti Popeye. Yeah, I think that's what Ebert said. Because uh, when you think about it, Tim Robbins' character uh, Griffin Mill, his his ability is that he gains super strength not when he eats spinach, but when he gets his hands around the necks of screenwriters. <laughs> and I I'm all for it. Like, do what what does a screenwriter even do? Yeah. And this was written by an author, so we know that screenwriters are replaceable. <laughs> Literally, we already had that job. They're called authors. They make the books, and then you make that a movie. They already made the words. 
I thought that was very cool that it's written by an author because it's very very like retro I guess well the you time retro as well it feels I mean this is set this is, is a contemporary set in the 90s but it has yeah. that like 40s oh, 50s sure, studio yeah. feel you know it's going for that sort of uh classic thriller style thing that yeah. uh, Columbo even kind of played upon. Definitely. I'm on Columbo a lot. <laughs> I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it has like that tiny bit of like film noir too. And you know, they, they even go and see, not that this is a film noir, I, I want to preface this so I'm not shot down in the street they go see the bicycle thief yeah but it has that kind of classic film noir. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um it, it has that very classic kind of pot boiler you know crime thriller of a film <laughs> yeah but in the 90s it feels to me kind of like um uh like a brian de palma film like body double mm. somewhere like that where it's a not quite giallo but it wants to be. It wants to be about sure. a little weirdo, and it wants to be shot in an interesting way. Mm -hmm. Of course, um, all all the Altman shots are consistent with his history of directing. He didn't do anything like wacky, completely different to how he usually does. But these like long takes and these POVs that he puts in a lot—they're very giallo coded types of yeah. uh, shot. Yeah, I think the main difference is that, and this isn't a criticism, but it, it lacks almost that magical aspect, the weird, like, possible mysticism that Giallo films have. Yeah. Um, This is more, I mean, just Hollywood. Going as realistic as possible. Uh, yeah. Down to just packing as many actor cameos as they could possibly get into it. But I mean, you got like, you got Burt Reynolds. You remember when you saw Burt Reynolds and Cher? Sure, yeah. Oh, Jeff Goldblum. Remember Jeff when Goldblum he turns? Is up. he the one? Isn't he the one who does the speed? Or he he, no. he has like a tiny little talking part, right? I think is he he's at the party at the beginning. He's at the party, yeah, exactly. We're gonna we're gonna take up a lot of time playing our favorite game. Where were they in the play? <laughs> Uh, Peter Falk and uh, course, Susan Sarandon. Columbo. Susan oh, no. Sarandon. Right at the end. Really? If, oh my god. We'll, we'll, we'll <laughs> put a pin in that because that ending is just so... Mwah. Yeah, we'll come back to that for sure. Uh, Malcolm McDowell, he walks past, mm -hmm. you know, our <laughs> podcast yeah, yeah. The regular Malcolm McDowell. <laughs> Um, uh, again, uh, Jack Lemmon. Jack Lemmon. Out of nowhere. Yeah. I mean, it's a long film. It's over two hours. Yeah. Um, to its benefit. But it is also made for $8 million. Can you believe that? I, I, I can. <laughs> um, well, yes, you can believe it because it, it exists as it is. I understand that. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, it's really impressive for what they did on, on kind of a even for the time, kind of a small budget. Yeah, I think it helps but, that um, Altman is so established. Yes, So I think he, he, can, he can get a lot of favors, probably. Oh, definitely. I'm I, sure I, none of those actor cameos were uh, expensive, if even paid for. Exactly. <laughs> we shot the whole thing without cuts. I hate all this. Cut, cut, cut. Oh, yeah, well, what about... Uh... Bertolucci, that great track he shot with Winger in Sheltering Sky. That's it. Maybe to reel it back to the start of the runtime, and as we had mentioned, these oneers. I yep. mean, can can we even talk about this film without talking about the intro sequence? And we could, but it wouldn't be a very good conversation. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's just a really good. It's just a really it is, yeah. amazing oneer. It's almost like ten minutes, I think. Opening with that like clapperboard kind of it changes the context of it a bit because mm. oneers are stylish and obviously you notice them while they're happening but like you can 
tell there's an entire crew of people behind that camera just with the inclusion of that clapperboard like mm -hmm. adding more into the scene to push forward the this is a film this is a story this isn't real kind of feeling throughout it yeah it really almost feels like the whole time you could you can see the sprocket yeah. on the side of the film right it it, it knows that it's also a film itself, of course. It would have been great if they put in a bunch of, like, boom in the shot. Just, like, wheel it down a little bit. Just keep reminding the audience it's a film. Keep the, uh, keep that would, the bit going. That would, that would really make an interesting kind of, uh, you know, story change, right? To, like, is it real what's happening in the, the Tim Robbins world you know is it a set is it real is it yeah all fake because at the end you know it's kind of fake well he gets the the pitch for the film that he's in the the, the whole time you're dealing with like films within the film but then it turns mm. out the film itself is a film within the film <laughs> the last little rug pull what do you call this thing anyway the player the player I like that. Yeah, it's it's got the layers. You know, it's interesting how how artistic and how kind of deep and emotional this film is, despite it being talking about uh, Hollywood removing artistry yeah, from yeah. the industry. Yeah. Well, there's the whole thing like in the film about um, Richard E. Grant's character. I don't remember the character name, but uh, you know, Richard. He's he's almost like a uh, Robert Altman stand-in where he's coming sure. to the studio with this very artful idea that's not very audience friendly his habeas corpus film mm -hmm. and then yeah it goes through the studio and it's used um f by griffin as a way to take down his his rival larry levy <laughs> a very comic mm, book name larry. but <laughs> by the end you see this film has been turned into a, a punchline and mm. I guess Robert feels that way about life about studios taking his films and turning them into trash he's got a lot of beef to work out this is a bit of a, a, a pointed one it ain't it ain't it uh, but yeah it's kind of a, almost like a a nerd's revenge film where the nerds are <laughs> screenwriters. Yeah. <laughs> um, kind of shows how little the industry cares about screenwriters because Tim Robbins just kind of chooses Vincent D'Onofrio, right? Yeah. He, he sort of goes through his books, sort of sees, like, who could it be? And, I don't know, not to spoil it too much, but... I mean, we're, we're, we're spoiling it. <laughs> All right, so we're spoiling it. He was not the person who was bothering him, you know, yeah. p putting in the phone calls and all that. I don't think but, we ever learn who is in no. the end. You know, you get the phone call from them, which that could also be not be them. Who knows? Um, but, yeah, I mean, as far as Griffin Mill, the character cares, you know, he did it. Like, that was it. You know, it could be any screenwriter. So he he chooses that one, and that's his fate, you know? Which is fun. But this is uh, very much just taking that energy of, like, seething annoyance with Hollywood and just, just, like, needling at it. Just loads of little satirical jabs. Yeah. Like, the uh, the big gala. The, the, the big part of that scene is Griffin giving his speech to the entire audience. I don't know what he's... What I don't know why he's giving the speech. I don't remember. <laughs> so he's just a he's just a producer, so it's yeah. like fucking. You know. He like ends that speech with uh, to maintain the art of motion pictures is a mm. primary mandate. <laughs> Interesting. Which is then followed up by the ending where they turn Habus Corpius into a Julia Roberts Bruce Willis uh, <laughs> romantic <laughs> drama. <laughs> yeah. It's just, you know, the inevitability of it all. This isn't even an American film. It's not. No, no. There are no stars, no pat happy endings, no 
Schwarzenegger has stick-ups, no, no terrorists. This is a tough story, a tragedy, in which an innocent woman dies. Why? Because that happens. I have, uh, I have one note that we cannot ever swing to naturally. Okay. I'm using swing to very pointedly. Uh, because my note simply reads, uh, Tim Robbins' bull's visible. Really? We have bull. I'm excited for the video version of this to come out so I can see you editing in his balls. I'll zoom in on the balls. There they are. Here's a 3D render of the balls, you know, wireframe. They're rotating. Oh, like wow. Fucking hackers. Enhance. 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 Yeah. Beautiful balls. Thanks, Tim. What's your opinion on Greta Sachki? How do you spell her? How do you pronounce that? <laughs> you know the 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 female lead. What do you what do you what is your personal opinion? Stop laughing at me. What's your personal uh, opinion on the name great. June Goodsman's daughter? She's she's great. Yeah, she's um. I I, I feel intentionally left out of quite a lot of the film. And it feels like uh, Griffin is using her as well, because he's just using everyone throughout the whole film. As you'd expect a producer to do. Yeah. yeah. I think it was very intentional that sort of we're we're building to this this big sex scene between them. The whole <laughs> film is like teasing it. It's got to happen. Yeah. And then we get to the end and it's all in close ups. <laughs> there is no nudity. <laughs> I think Robert Altman is playing us all for chumps when it comes to, like, gratification yeah. of the the naked body. Even the artistic June and the, like, the movie itself trying to be transgressive is not above <laughs> the Hollywood censors. <laughs> of course, him, him, you know, in a way, yeah. Altman probably censoring himself for the joke. Yeah, well, we get a bit of nudity at the beginning with... Uh, Bonnie, the other executive yes. at the studio, when they're in the hot tub together. Of course. <clears throat> but that's it, I think. I don't remember anything else. As far as I can recall. And of course, I've got the the pervert's photographic memory of naked body. Oh yeah, oh yeah. We would have. We would know. We would know. That's why I think um, it's intentional that. Tim Robbins is the naked body we see at the end. I think it's <laughs> sort of a, uh, a, a, a last fuck you to the uh, audience of studio films that are just here for a bit of nudity, a bit of TNA. Right. The male gaze. Gaze on these nuts. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> and you know they hang at eye level because he's tall as fuck. Because <laughs> he's fuck. <laughs> yeah, you're staring at, you know, his Fruit of the Loom logo. <laughs> you know, that's eye level for most people. God, what a, what a beautiful tall man. Did you watch the commentary when you watched the film? I didn't know. Is there anything insightful? Uh, there are two little insightful things. Um, All right, hit me. One about Tim Robbins' balls, one not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's start with the one that's not about it. You always start with the bad news first. All right, the bad news. Uh, there's a there's a line that Robert Altman says during the credits. Um, he he's talking about like the portrayal of like being rich and successful as an ideal in American society, and he says the line, "I kind of like this thing where we don't like rich people too much." <laughs> I feel like after watching this, yeah, I he doesn't like rich people that much. He fucking man, no, he's he's does not have anything favorable to say about any of these people. <laughs> and he also talks about the Tim Robbins Bulls scene. Of course. More importantly, put <laughs> right. politics aside for a second. <laughs> uh, Tim Robbins circumcised. Oh, but thanks for that info, Rob. <laughs> there's more info. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, when they were putting together the character profile... They wanted him to be an uncircumcised man. What a what an so, absolute windfall. Guess who got a shaft prosthesis <laughs> just so he could be uncircumcised oh. for two frames of a film. Whoa, that's fucking character acting. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't I, I thought you were saying that Tim was cut, but it turns out he 
He's got the hood. This was the player uncut version. <laughs> oh, but um, uh. So would you give this a foreskin or a circumcised? <laughs> That's a loaded question right there, buddy. Because <laughs> look, I have my preferences, but also I, I can't. <laughs> and I've seen them all too, so, but look. Yeah. It's a you good have film. to answer. You have no, to it's answer. a good film. It's a good film. Do you think Ebert would have accepted a no from <laughs> from Cisco? You have to answer. Joel, I give it a circum an uncircumcised. <laughs> you almost fucking blew it, buddy. Because I don't even fucking know what's right or what's wrong. I'm giving Much it like an this film. uncircumcised too. It's right uh, there on the screen. Zoom and enhance. 3D model. Let's go. I would like the record to show that I am also a fan of penises. They're okay, too. I'm going to edit that out just to fuck with you. No. I'll leave most of it in, but the important part will be censored. <laughs> we lost all of our Jewish listeners. Damn. Paul Bartel and Mary Warrenov play Paul and Mary Bland, two middle-class American wannabe Epicureans. Their dreams of opening up a cozy French restaurant in the Californian countryside are in danger when news that the perfect provincial chateau is up for sale. Many people want to buy, but the plans are strapped for cash. When the wine industry fails to pay dividends for Paul, they turn to other means of income. With the help of Raoul, played by Robert Beltran, client work proves profitable. Of course, we're talking LA clients, swingers, corrupt bankers, and scariest of all, Joe Dante. Is it a comedy? Yes, but not the type of you're used to. Eating Raoul, rated R. Cringe, but not like <laughs> the modern version of cringe. Like, um, like cringe from the creep horror. show trailer. Cringe. Hmm, I like it. Um, <laughs> Joel, what do you think of eating Raoul? And I know the answer. <clears throat> uh, I I like it enough to buy it. That's that's my review. That's that's a fucking endorsement right there. <laughs> I own I own four Criterions. One of mm -hmm. them isn't the player because that shit fifty quid. Are you kidding me? But I nice own man. fucking eating Raoul. Two yep. John Waters and Repo Man. All of which will come up at a later date. I'm but sure. That's how good it is. I bought I I spent the fifty quid just to have it. And coming from you, that's a real endorsement. Yeah. You don't buy shit. I buy two dollar DVDs. <laughs> Would you say this is one of your favorite films? Sure. I mean yeah. I might, I might, I might put it in my fucking sight and sound, if I were feeling particularly fruity, the day of. I wonder how many other people put Eating Raoul in their sight and sound. Probably nobody. I think anyone did. But everybody loves this film. Yeah. It's a cult classic. I've never met anyone who doesn't like it, and if you don't like it, shut up. <laughs> I mean, I imagine swingers wouldn't like this film. It's fine though. Paul doesn't like swingers. Paul That's doesn't clear. either. There's there's a beautiful part where the uh, commentary people are talking about Paul, and they're like, "Do you want to like go and like study these swingers? Like, no, like go to a party, see what they do." And Paul goes, "I would like, I would not like to know anything about these swingers." <laughs> <laughs> you know, and his yeah, it's good that his... you're working on your Paul Bartel impression. <laughs> Yes, as we know, I will soon become Paul Bartel. Ball, you gotta Ball be Bartel. Ball Bartel. <laughs> That's a good drag name, I guess. Oh, okay. I don't know yeah. if anybody would get it, but it's okay. No. That's, that's most drag names, though. Yeah, they were talking about how even up to his, his final days, you know, he, he had surgery for liver cancer. And everybody was like, you gotta rest, Paul, but he would not stop going out to dinners, would not stop going out to the theater. 
And I and you know what? That is what I am going for. He, that he is was what just I want. Living, from what it seems, just didn't even care that he was dying. He just kept living. You know what's the point of going on if you can't enjoy the theater, right? Go out there while you still can. What's the point in going on if you have to live in Hollywood? Is the follow-up oh. question. Because <laughs> this man hates Hollywood. He is definitely, yeah, he, he has a lot of th things to say, but no, there's no one person in this film who is good on any moral compass. No, not at all. I think, um... Yeah, everyone's like a rapist except for Paul. <laughs> right, like you, 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 you tried to think yeah. of one person. You tried I, to I think scan of one. the characters. They're all awful. <laughs> I mean, it opens with a montage of just like kidnappings and fucking prostitutes. Like, it, it, you can tell what he's going for from minute one. Exactly. That was actually an afterthought that they just had to like put in to like kind of relay the, the thesis of yeah. this film to you make know? it obvious and i think that they do it perfectly you get like kidnapping yeah. you get like you know houseless people on the street it's just not a not the place to be so did it just open on the uh the liquor store where he works uh, yes. right at the beginning that feels like a part of it that feels like the mm. this is hollywood this is how bad it is kind of vibe right you have paul who is Perhaps a little too highbrow for this liquor store. <laughs> yeah, they get they get held up at gunpoint. And he just just shoots them. The store owner, not Paul. <laughs> and he's wearing a kick-ass fucking shirt. <laughs> the best shirt I've ever seen. He has a really me. cool like Hawaiian like floral shirt. He, that's the kind of boss I want. <laughs> I used to do shirt watch. Whenever I saw a shirt, I'd keep mm. it like in a film. I'd keep it. On my Twitter, which I don't use anymore. Oh. Because Twitter's dead. Yeah. But, uh, I, I, we can revive Shirt Watch just for, just for this episode of Digital Nitrate. So on today's episode of Shirt Watch, we have the liquor store owner from Eating Raul. Wow, look at that. Beautiful shirt. I give it a solid 8 out of 10. An 8? You're, you're kidding. No, Anything below a 10 doesn't get on shirt watch, so... Oh, okay, then well, fuck me, I guess. <laughs> this ain't a rating system. <laughs> <laughs> it's a shirt watch. <laughs> what do you... Fucking grow up. This world is overflowing with millions of sexual freaks. We're so lucky to have found each other. I know. Good night, dear. Sweet dreams. Well, in that case, I suggest a plush watch. Yeah, because want of, to talk about the plushie. I want to talk about Paul Bartel's wine plushie that he has that he goes to bed with. It's the cutest little thing. I think Mary also has a few that are unnotable. Kind of like, yeah. It, like, whatever, like plushies. Whatever. The wine yeah. plushie. It's just a huge bottle of wine. <laughs> it's a specific and bottle that, that whinies will know, probably. I'm sure you could identify it and be like, ah, the vintage, very good. But they also like sleep in their separate beds, because they're a, a, sex, a sexless couple. Mm -hmm. Stuffed on that one. Don't read into it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, they're, li they're literally called the Blands, right? Paul and right. Mary Bland. Yep. And, um... The whole film kind of has this vibe of, like, new wave sucks, traditional is the way to go. Um... Yeah, because they, the, they have their separate beds, and they have their uh, country kitchen. I mean, they're deciding between, was it Shea Bland and Paul yep. and Mary's country <laughs> kitchen. Country kitchen. Wow. And they decide on the country kitchen, which... I mean, your contrast in Shea Bland, which sounds very modern, very hip, and Country Kitchen, which sounds like Crack a Barrel. So you've got this mix-up of, like, these are very sort of traditional, probably classy Republican voting straight people. Yeah, very straight down the line. Which is why it's funny that they have to now kill sex offenders. <laughs> <laughs> That's what makes it funny. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a great point that somebody brought up about how, you know, it, it seems like it's maybe supporting 
traditional means and traditions and whatnot. Yeah. Um, but it's more so like this is the vision of how the middle class sees themselves. And you see this with yeah. with people who have money. Is you know they they hate seeing the violence and the corruption and the death and the human meat and dog food, <laughs> but when it comes to their problems, you know, what's a little bop on the head with a frying pan? You killed him. What? But I mean, it's it's the whole comicness of the whole thing. It it definitely does not take yeah. itself seriously. The whole thing is just a. A farcical romp as the kids there, say there's a lot of like cartoony aspects to it a lot of uh yeah stuff like when he's driving around in the van uh, Raul <laughs> is driving around oh after yeah kind of a little fallout and Paul is <laughs> just on top of the van and uh, like he's not hidden at all but the gag is that Raul can't see him Still because can't it's see a it. cartoon moment yeah He's just lying up there watching, taking down notes on a notepad. <laughs> <laughs> He's got his little uh, little phantom mask on, <laughs> so you can't so you can't make his identity. You know, <laughs> just this killing costume as a whole, <laughs> just this like burglar's outfit, basically. And speaking of shoestring budgets, I oh, mean, yeah. <laughs> the Paul fought tooth and nail for this film. Definitely did not bring up eight million dollars, but they 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 had to get the shooting, the interior shooting on that apartment done, um, because the landlords were going to tear down that building, right? And they were going to raise it, and Paul was like, "Can we make a double of this in a studio?" And they were like, mm -mm, "No, we cannot." <laughs> so they had to get in there and like shoot the fuck out of it because <laughs> you have a deadline <laughs> you have a literal like you will die if you're still here by now deadline <laughs> when they bring the apartment building down upon them the uh it's the same with the house at the end the oh yeah like rich person swinger house i think they only had one night there so they had to shoot all of that segment in like one night. Oh yeah, they were there to like dawn. You can even see the the sun peeking through at times. <laughs> yeah. Um and it may have been in a Beatles music video. Probably not from what it looks like, but <laughs> probably not. It, it was on blue it was on Blue Jay Way, which is yeah. where that song is uh And that's kind of like a, a a tree falls in the wood scenario, you know, who remembers that? Right. So did it really happen? <laughs> No, George Harrison was never actually there. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if, if 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 John's shot in the back and no one's there to see it, did it really happen? I mean, that that saying would go a lot further if not for the fact that there were literally hundreds of people around when he got shot. I guess, yeah. And also his wife. Yeah. And the shooter. Yeah. I just like to mention that he got shot, though. He did get shot. I have no respect. <laughs> Speaking of Johns with no respect, um, John Landis makes an appearance. <laughs> what a goddamn segue. You're welcome for that. Send, send that to the Emmys right fucking now and I'll accept my award tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, he's got like 30 seconds where he comes in and sexually assaults uh, Mary walking past her in the bank. He's, he's in so many little films from the past. Because he was he just he just cameos. He just He's takes successful. a cameo. Yeah. Um someone with a little more respect in the world is a I don't know, does Joe Dante get respect? Oh, Joe Dante gets respect from <laughs> he us, gets mad and that's all that matters. So we he love plays, uh, um, Joe Dante. We do. He plays the waiter yeah, in the, the restaurant. Bus boy who like the bus takes boy. his plates away after Paul has his wine stolen. <laughs> yeah, he's stood up. Um but Joe Dante also like made this film exist by letting them use his office <laughs> well they're all um they're all roger corman uh yes. in, in the orbit of roger corman and i knew bringing up roger corman would really start a whole tangent but uh and now we're talking about corman <laughs> i mean roger corman just had his fingers in so many films that uh 
we love and we love to talk about may have been one of the most important producers ever at least from like the b movie genre you know angle he he, he made so much of that exist because by all accounts he's a very successful producer director all of that you know but he just loved to to make those little films that made lots of money and i know like joe dante was a protege of his that's the that's the big one I don't know if John Landis was a protege or just a collaborator, but mm. he was in the orbit. Uh, and even like Paul Bartel did Death Race 2000. That's his big, yeah. Corman gave him Death Race and uh, Cannonball because he, he came under some suggestion that Paul Bartel was a car guy who liked cars. <laughs> this was not a true fact by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> He's like, yeah, fuck it, uh, direct death race, and then we'll give you cannonball. We, you, you like the cars, right, Paul? <laughs> but yeah, we would not have, I think, Paul Bartel on any aspect if he never got death race and cannonball, where it's like he yeah, probably, probably did not care about these, but they made him lots of money and allowed him to to live this lavish lifestyle of <laughs> going to the theater and dinners and barely scraping enough, enough money to make an independent feature. Well, those are probably his two most known films uh, yeah. because they were his highest budgeted ones. Yeah. And they have that kind of uh, 70s genre that people like the the, the genre-ness about it. Yeah. The Cars and the David Carradine. Love Davey. And a what? Cock ring. Oh, a cock ring? What size? Hey. The latest issue of Nuns and Nazis. Tuesday. Couple That's something of... I did. Oh. oh. No, you got it. Fuck! <laughs> <laughs> something I wanted to talk about a little bit. There's something oh, yeah? I wanted to talk about a little bit because uh, obviously it's relevant to us, to our Halloween mm. special that happened two, two days fucking ago. years ago. Two days ago, yep. Two <laughs> days ago. <laughs> <laughs> Canonically. Uh, there's a scene where Paul enters a sex shop yes. to buy yep. a dildo. A perhaps. big old dildo. And the clerk behind the desk is John Paragon, who yep. uh, we last saw during a epic marathon Alvira discussion because he's the gas station clerk in Alvira during the scene with the, the, the uh, chicken fried steak song. Exactly. Um... A lot of Groundlings guys in this. A lot of Pee Wee Herman cast. <laughs> another another orbiting factor. Edie McClurg turns yep. up at the swingers party, obviously. That's the other, the big one. Yep. And I believe they wanted to get Paul Rubens, Pee Wee himself. Mr. Pee Wee, yes. But he uh, became famous. So Sadly he became not famous. not allowed to yeah. be in this film anymore. <laughs> There, yeah, there's certainly a, a caliber of fame that <laughs> would make it onto <laughs> this one. And and Pee Wee, surprisingly, was too famous for this. Paul is such an interesting character in that sense of, like, considered a respected director, considered, like, one of the... and a very important one, part of, like, a great generation of directors, but just, like, I feel like if you don't seek him out... No one's gonna talk about him. Yeah, it's difficult to just like get to Paul Bartel. There's no direct link, really. Right, or at least you gotta dig deep. I guess like people who watch fucking Death Race, Shopping Mall. You remind me of your mother. It's the laser eyes. Or like Rock and Roll High School. They'll like see this weird bald man and maybe think, "What has this guy done?" <laughs> I mean, and that's it. Other than that, like, there's nothing. Uh, Paul was also in Gremlins 2, actually. Was I just he? remembered. Whoa, yeah. that's awesome. Uh, you know the Hulk Hogan scene when it pulls out to the cinema? And no. uh, Paul, uh, Paul Bartel is the usher in the oh, cinema. Oh, cute. Who, uh, who, I believe he says to Hulk Hogan, uh, excuse me, sir, we have a Gremlins in the projector room. <laughs> <laughs> Gremlins in this theater now. You can't teach that. 
You know, the the method doesn't <laughs> teach you that. <laughs> what you learn on the streets of uh, New Jersey. <laughs> hey. There's not a big, uh, big jump between Bartal and Bourdain. No, I guess they they both left Jersey to become s um, cynical bastards. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of Paul getting no respect, um, they even or he even put together a whole sequel for this. I don't know if you know about it. I I do I do know about it. I I do in fact know about it. Whoa! Um, in fact, not ten seconds ago we were discussing. It. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Podcast <laughs> magic. <laughs> um. <laughs> Yeah, bland ambition. Bland I ambitions. Believe. Yes, slated to be produced in 1989, but was the funding was pulled ten days before the start of filming. Um, but yeah, it would have been Paul and Mary happily doing their thing with uh, Paul and Mary's Country Kitchen, and then uh, it was this was based off of a real story with Nixon trying to get into like a fancy restaurant but they like wouldn't let him cut line <laughs> and good for them but yeah the, it was supposed to be uh, the governor of California stopped for lunch and, and he just couldn't get in so he sends a, a health inspector to close him down and this uh, this is what makes it kind of that Paul Bartel thing is that the, the revenge story is that they're going to run against <laughs> this governor for the gubernatorial uh, election as a as a Republican nominee, Paul and Mary Bland. <laughs> Paul's running as the Republican candidate against the old Democrat that shut him down. Yeah, that's a beautiful... Do you remember who was supposed to play that Democrat? Uh, don't know who was going to play that, but... You're, you're going to flip, literally. You're going to stand up and do a backflip. Watch me. Do it. Hit me. John Waters. Wow. <laughs> I thought, oh, right, he's, he's going to be the governor. I thought he was going to play. There was something about an orphanage. I think he was the governor that, like, shut him down. Unless I'm wrong. Uh, we'll just go with it and call it um, realistic fiction, if it's false. I'm not watching that shit again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> In any case, John Waters was going to be there, which um, yeah. makes sense, because Lust in the Dust was a few years before that. Uh, it it had to have been, I guess. Either way, um, uh, Paul Bartel knowing John Waters is the least surprising thing I could probably yeah. tell you. <laughs> if we literally had the cinematic version of Paul Bartel versus John Waters. Oh, beautiful. It would have been unstoppable. It would have been a cinematic uh, tentpole, honestly. It, it would it would kind of be like our version of uh, Tadanobu Asano and Joe Dagiri. When they finally came together, but... Twice. Twice. So tell me, Joel, would you give this a country kitchen or a Shea Bland? Uh, I mean, we're, we're back to the foreskin debate. <laughs> where I'm not against modernization, but it seems <laughs> as you've posed country kitchen as the op, then <laughs> I guess it's a country kitchen. <laughs> This is some, like, Orwellian shit. This is how they get you. <laughs> <laughs> this episode has been nothing but 1984. Okay? It's a fucking mess. We now fucking hate modernization and circumcision, and there's nothing we can do to stop it. This is what we are stamping into the sands of history. But no, I, I love this film. It's, and it's one of the best films ever made, and uh, it should be talked about more yes should be higher higher regarded it's less than 90 minutes or about 90 minutes or something probably probably 90 minutes I 83 don't, I don't minutes 83 minutes and like the setup Perfect. gets done in like yeah. 10 you know 80 it like invite your partner around snuggle in bed put it on you'll have a good time yeah or don't because you're asexual and that's fine you still have a partner if you're asexual. What? 
<laughs> let's not let's not alienate everybody for fuck's sake. <laughs> if you're circumcised, you can watch it. It's fine. We won't watch it with <laughs> you. <but. Ow. laughs> oh god. We like to sit down in a room full of uncircumcised boys and put on eating Raul, and we all roll our full skins <laughs> up and down <laughs> our head. And you're not invited. <laughs> I think we should cut this one. Nah, this is this is perfect. It's what Paul would have wanted. Probably. That sick bastard. So, Chandler, big day tomorrow. <sighs> we gotta talk to that studio executive about mm. getting those films out of our fucking goddamn motherfucking salt mine. It's really annoying that the executives are only there from 4.30 a.m. to 6 a.m. every day. You know how unhelpful they are. But it is what it is, and if we don't get them out of our salt mine, all of that explosives in there is gonna go up or something. Explosives? They have a completely fucked up idea that has no second act. If I hadn't heard it myself, I never would have believed it. <laughs>